So hello everyone and well, welcome to Alone Together, Together series. I'm Elena Deleva and I'm the Executive Director of Elizabeth Kostova Foundation. For those of you who are new to our work, we are Bulgarian-American literary nonprofit so that creates literary bridges between uh, Bulgaria and the Anglophone world. At the onset of this pandemic, we launched the Alone Together initiative as a way to connect the network of the Suzopo Fiction Seminars, which take place annually on Black Sea Coast in Bulgaria, bringing together Bulgarian and American writers. And because literature cannot be quarantined, after we launched the, the series, we received um, more submissions that we anticipated. So we run the series through June. You can check all the text on our website. We will be posting the link in the chat uh, field. So I'm so pleased uh, to be joined today by three of the contributors to a Loan Together series. Kakka Kasabova in the UK, Elizabeth Kostova in the US, and Christopher Fenton in Bulgaria. There will be more forthcoming events, so please consider joining our uh, mailing list. Uh, we'll post uh, the link as well in the chat field. And uh, we are beyond grateful to Sofia Municipality for supporting this uh, series and for everybody who also donated to this specific event. We'll be posting the donation link as well uh, in the chat. Thank you so much. And although we can't see you uh, in this webinar, we'd we'll love to hear from you. So after the reading, um, uh, we can, we'll go through your questions and we'll try to answer as many as possible. But actually, you can start posting your questions right now in the chat field. Um, with that being said, let me introduce our moderator today, uh, Christopher Fenton. Uh, Christopher was actually a Suzopo Fiction Seminar Fellow in 2017, but his connection with Bulgaria started seven years earlier, uh, back in 2010, when he, with his wife Claire, he traveled to Bulgaria in search for a place to reconnect with the land. As if, Chris, you were anticipating this COVID-19 <laughs> ordeal, right? <Yeah. laughs> And together with his wife, they set up a small coding, uh, coding in a remote Bulgarian village where they currently live. And his recent story, Stuyan, set in the same village, actually won Nowhere Magazine's travel writing contest. Congratulations once again. And it's part of a memoir that is forthcoming. It's called Waiting for the Goats, uh, for the Goats, sorry. Uh, in which he explores memory, history, and yogurt in the near deserted Bulgarian uh, village. So, um, Chris, I hope you will be able to hear your story as well in the course of the conversation tonight. And the stage is yours now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Milena. Well, it's uh, fantastic to be here. I'm actually not in Bulgaria. I'm in Greece. Um, very close to the sea on the island of Thassos. Um, hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Kapka. Hi. Great to, hi. Great to hear you and see you, Elizabeth. Uh, it's, a real, <laughs> it's a real privilege to be talking to you both, fantastic writers and wonderful people. Um, both of you are hugely important in, the, in framing the way that the rest of the world sees Bulgaria through literature, especially in, uh, especially its relations to its own history. Uh, Kapka's three uh, books on this area, Street Without a Name deals with Bulgaria, border with uh, the frontier zone between Greece, Turkey and Bulgaria. And the most recent one to the lake, uh, the the border between well Lake Ocrid on the border between Albania, North Macedonia, and Greece. And in all three of her books, she takes us on a personal journey, sometimes harsh, sometimes joyful, but it's always in the words of a poet and with the research rigor of an academic. Elizabeth's two books on this area, Historian and Shadowland, um, create beautiful, compelling stories which are impossible to turn away from or to forget. 
And we shouldn't forget as well that Elizabeth's contribution to Bulgarian literature is through the foundation, which is so good at promoting young Bulgarian writers and translations of Bulgarian literature into English, as well as bringing people together, bringing writers together from all over the world. Um, so they've both written accounts of their lockdown experiences. And one of the things that strikes me about it is they the, the are quite different accounts. Even though we think we've been through the same experience on the lockdown, I've got a fly interested in my eyes. Um, we can come up with very different experiences and maybe we could talk about that later. So first of all, then let's go to Elizabeth and I'll invite you to read your piece. All right, and I'm just going to switch over here for a minute. Um, I'm not, it's, it's a long piece and I wrote it for Alone Together and um, I don't think I would have attempted to write a pandemic piece otherwise. So I'm very <laughs> grateful, <laughs> very grateful for this inspiration. And before I read a little bit, I just want to say how much I appreciate what Milena Deleva has done to make this series happen and to, to bring us all together in the middle of this extraordinary situation. It's really been a great deal of work done very skillfully. So thank you, Milena. And also thanks to Chris. And I'm also thrilled to, I, I won't say see, but hear Kafka and her beautiful voice. And I feel as if I'm seeing you, Kafka. We've worked together before and read together in public. And this is really a special occasion to, to be with you again. So um, am I, is my voice showing up? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear yes. you. Yes. Oh, great. Okay, excellent. All right, there's a little lag. So I'm going to read just uh, a paragraph that is, or two, just about an one, um, experience I have had in pandemic, and I know we've, we've all as individuals and as writers and as readers, as human beings, we've all had such similar and yet such different experiences. Um, and I think this, the stories that will come out of this time will be when they're, when they all, we start getting all of them, they will be a mind boggling mass. And one of the experiences I had, which I, I've shared with, um, uh, a lot of other people is that I, I decided that I would celebrate Passover with my oldest friend by, um, uh, by <laughs> FaceTime. And uh, she's Jewish. I'm not Jewish, although I have Jewish family members. And I, I really wanted to be with her at this time. And so I'm going to read this very really quite personal passage. And um, but I think this is a, a time that calls sometimes for the very personal. This evening, I celebrated Passover with my oldest friend, who's six months younger than I. We've been each other's right hands for 50 years as of this coming August. I wonder if we'll get to celebrate our, quote, anniversary in person now. She is high risk for COVID-19 and for almost any virus. She's Jewish, I'm nothing, or fumblingly Buddhist. She's living temporarily in a basement apartment at her brother's house in New England. I'm in North Carolina, locked in with many people. Her father died last Saturday evening in New York City of COVID. No one but a very kind social worker could be with him. But that social worker showed him three younger generations of his family on FaceTime the day before he died. And he was still lucid still recognizing them. I loved him. He had the warmest voice. He taught me how to dive and how to raise and lower sails and treated me like an extra daughter. My friend tells me ahead of time what to prepare for the Passover plate, since we'll each have one. Fortunately, there are bitter greens already sprouting in my small garden, wild onion. Spring in North Carolina is about three weeks ahead of spring in New England. And from what I can tell, from what I can tell, I ask her to let me ask the ritual questions. Even if she's slightly younger in years, I am younger in Judaism. 
We each sit alone with FaceTime between us, reading from the Haggadah she has chosen. She utters the Hebrew gracefully, although she wasn't raised with it. I stumble through the phonetic Latin spellings, plague, liberation, wandering, thankfulness as the wrath passes over, sparing loved ones, and 10 drops of wine on the plate for the wrath that lands on others, killing them. Before we begin, she cries. I almost cry. Afterward, we continue to sit on each side of FaceTime, my candles still lit in North Carolina, eating hard-boiled eggs together. Tomorrow, I will wake up thinking it is another first in our lives together. May it pass over us. And that's, I'll stop there. It's a long piece. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was amazing. That, I think you've chosen my, my favorite piece from your whole piece because it was so touching. Um, the, the, the feeling of you being there with your friend and wanting so much to be with her properly, with her. You, you're always using these quotation marks, aren't you, in your, your piece. Um, it really came across, it was very moving. And it, it, the whole business, I think, about um, dying alone is maybe the ultimate tragedy of this whole thing. That so many people have had to do that. And it makes me feel really sad. Um, but you're, are you going to read any more pieces or is it just that one? Uh, I thought I'd leave it at that one because I'm eager to, to hear. Um, I, of course, I've cool. read Keith and Kafka's, but I'm eager for there to be plenty of time for those. Okay. Thank well, fantastic. You. Well, can, can I just ask you a question about another part of the. <laughs> yes, please. There's a there's a there's a piece in uh, the where you you go shopping and you see there's a shop assistant um, and you talk about how you wish she was wearing a mask um, so you say to her thanks for doing your essential work you know you're an essential worker and you 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 share something which we've all we've all done looked at someone and thought, mm, I wish she was wearing a mask. But then immediately in the next line, uh, it's tempered by this. If she had been wearing a mask, I would never have seen her smile, which was a lovely thing to say. Uh, and then she says to you, we'll be better people afterward. My, my question is to you, do you agree with her? I, you know, that's a hard question to answer. It's a simple question, but it's like uh, many simple questions, it's profound. <laughs> and yeah. I, I have, I'm going to be a little slippery on this one. I don't know, but I am hopeful. And I'm, I'm particularly hopeful in the last two weeks, seeing mm. that what has happened in the US uh, is, an absolute outbursting of rage and pain over a lot of issues um, with the focus on racial inequities and violence, um, racially inspired violence. Hello, Kapka. Hi, Kapka. <laughs> I'm leaving. can see you now. <laughs> and now everyone else can too. Hey, I'm so glad. <laughs> Although your voice by itself is so gorgeous, it was, <laughs> it was almost, almost enough. So yeah, I'm feeling, um, I hope, I don't know if we'll be better people, but I believe we're already more awake people. And maybe that's a more important thing right now. This, this is the first event in our lifetimes, I think, and maybe in the history of the world that has reached into this COVID event, that has reached into every single household on the planet, even just in the form of fear. and. Um, I'm hoping that that creates a kind of neural pathway to, for us to be able to communicate as a planet about things that are really threatening us and were before COVID. And, um, you know, it's a horrible way to wake up, but we certainly have needed to. 
So that I know that's the sort of half answer, but maybe that's what we're dealing with these days is half. half yeah, sure. Answer. Yeah, you, it, it's an impossible question to answer, really, but you can yeah, do exactly what you did. What, what about you, Kapka? Do you think we'll be better people afterward? Yeah, I, I mean, I've been wondering, um, you know, whether there is, there is some sort of, you know, we live in such divided times and even the virus in some ways has been divisive. And at the same time, you know, it's a very paradoxical era that we're all um, living through. Divisions seem to deepen, but at the same time, a raised awareness, um, a kind of, dare I say, um, a, a, a and a, a sort of awakening uh, might be occurring on our planet, um, a greater awareness of, of just how inextricably connected we all are. And I think this mm. virus, exactly as Elizabeth was saying, has been a real eye-opener. Um, if It's not as if we haven't had opportunities, you know, eye-openers until now leading up to this. Um, but it, there is something I think about experiencing a crisis personally for certain home truths to really sink in. Until that happens, until we have experiential sort of wisdom or an experiential shock, a lot of things remain distant, you know, wars are over there, environmental catastrophes are sort of over there on the other side of the fence. But when it comes knocking on our own door, there is an awakening effect. And I, I see that as something very positive potentially for, um, you know, in terms of the forces that, that bring us together. Uh, and I think nature is one, one such example of interconnectedness. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a, what you were saying there, Elizabeth, about the recent protests, which have been amazing, haven't they, in the way that they've expanded and kept going. I mean, there's a passage in your piece that actually almost predicts that. When you talk about this black light which shines on forgotten injustices and forgotten and values that we've kind of ignored. Um, you know, maybe there's a connection there between the experience of the virus and, and the lockdown and this explosion, as you call it, this explosion of uh, rage. I, I think there is, and I, I really uh, very much agree with what Kapka just said. And I was very struck reading the pieces in Alone Together in this series, which I, I hope all our listeners and participants will will take a look at um and uh i was struck by how many including your piece kafka very strongly and your piece chris especially in its conclusion dealt with this same um sense of you know we uh, we have all these interconnected problems um and maybe maybe this is our wake up call, the wake up call for our generation and the next one, possibly. So it was just very striking how, how many um, writers in all these different genres uh, in two languages and in some way either came to that con general conclusion or included those ideas. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it's striking, yeah. Um, so do we want to go to Kapka now? Do you want to read your piece, Kapka? Yeah, I'll, I'll try and get through it quickly. Uh, are you in the gallery, by the way? Yes, I'm in the gallery. Are, are you in the gallery? Right now, by the way, <laughs> this, is, this is an art gallery for contemporary Scottish art. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, you can see, yeah, some of the highlands painted behind me in these abstract works. Uh -huh. And in keeping with the Highland theme, my piece is, is dedicated to a woodland, a disappearing woodland um, next to which I live, which is called Bal Blair Wood. I used to live on the edge of a woodland called Bal Blair. I haven't moved house, but now I live on the edge of an open pit quarry, open, owned by a cement aggregate with nearly a billion pounds annual turnover. 
It is half owned in turn by one of Britain's richest men, who is very private, they say. Next to it is the Scottish Highlands' largest power substation. And on the edge of it all, a log processing plant that used to be run by just one local woodcutter, but has now expanded in tune with the quarry, the substation, the pylons. The log lorries too have become bigger and the vehicles that come to cut down the trees, take away the trees, extract the earth, carry away the gravel and build larger roads. During the first week of coronavirus lockdown in Scotland, the quarry felled another large swathe of forest. Nobody could see or hear. This was called by them phase two. I remember phase one some years ago when I walked across a field of resin bleeding trees and felt like my heart was breaking. Phase two has been a repeat of that. They are soon moving to phase three, by, by the end of which no woodland will be left. Over the years, since the quarry began turning the woods into pits, the name Balblair has stopped being associated with the ancient woodland. It is now the name of the quarry, the, the substation, the log processing plant. This is how places, beings, cultures become extinct sometimes, first physically, then their names are forgotten or appropriated by the impounders. Out of my window, I see a small slice of the world and all of it. Balblair is a microcosm of our planet. It's all that is time deep and life-giving and simultaneously all that is extracted and exterminated. While confined by the pandemic, we can survey at leisure the cause of the pandemic. Extraction, extermination, extinction of ecosystems, human, vegetal, animal, arboreal. The highland clearances of the 18th and 19th century cleared the land of crofters, that is small, small time farmers, and replaced them with grazing sheep. The objective was to make money from sheep. Many lairds were absentee owners already living in London with no relationship to the land. This was a precursor to the multinational quarry of today, the substation, the logging plant. Balblair Woods with its Celtic burial cairns, ruined druidic churches, badger and deer, nesting birds, mushroom colonies and trees whose roots are an underground city, the river that runs to the firth of the great land, glen known as the Ness, the jumping salmon in spring, which hasn't been jumping because it's apparently disappearing. To watch this being turned into a pit is to understand the nature of our collective disease, to feel it in your own body and soul. The earth, I feel, has invited us to look into the open pit forced to stay at home, knowing exactly where everybody is. It's a kind of naked feeling, and we are naked, we are ill. We have now an opportunity to stare at our own condition close up. We can no longer pretend that the local is separate from the global, that the open pit quarry is just in Baublair, that the war is just in Syria, that the burning forest is just in Australia, that the refugees are other, or that we are safe behind new expensive walls, that we personally will never run down a burning street with all our possessions in a plastic bag, like the refugees, and that it's business as usual. And I am kind of glad about that. This opportunity that the earth has given us in a way uh, which is so awful and bleak on the one hand, yet as Elizabeth was um, saying so beautifully, uh, a kind of chance at, at a kind of awakening and reconnecting with each other and with the earth. Okay, thanks Kupka. Incredibly powerful. Um, and interesting to hear you talk about home, to write about home. You know, someone who's always writing about as a car vendor. So I'm actually outside. 
um, <laughs> someone who's who, who's who we're used to talk about other places. It's uh, it's interesting, if not very sad, but also powerful, to hear you read, write about home. Um, but equally very important, I think you've made this connection between what went on in front of you, cynically, under the lockdown, which is one horrible part of it, isn't it? The fact that they took that particular time to do it, mm. which kind of, well, what, what does that say? That's maybe the first question. What does that say about the forces that we're all up against in trying to uh, tackle climate, not just climate change, but any kind of environmental and social thing? These people are, will stop at nothing. Mm. That's right. I think it's very, well, it's uh, what it says is, is very clear, isn't it? It's a, the supreme, supreme cynicism in this kind of land grabbing and resource grabbing um, with, a very, with a very sort of short term, um, sort of myopic, um, ultimately destructive and self-destructive um, view of uh, profit and growth. And, you know, I, I recently came across the word degrowth for the first time. I don't know if it's been around for a long time, but it struck me as very, um, a very appropriate uh, term to adopt, um, you know, uh, in the wake of this pandemic. We need to start thinking of, of a kind of, um, of a culture of degrowth, this, this endless growth that, you know, global capitalism and has been pursuing is, um, has ground to a halt. Um, you know, the, I, I think with the quarry, dealing with the quarry and everything that has been happening next door has been very revealing um, in terms of differences in mentality, but also time lags. I feel that this industrial sort of grabbing of resources, the industrial mindset is very 20th century, which we are no longer in. You know, we have moved on. We need a 21st century approach. To, to resources and the fact that they are finite uh, and we need to start treating land resources and earth resources with with respect um, as something that is part of us rather than something separate from us and I think a lot of people are realizing this now um, yeah that's, that's in, sorry you, you go ahead Elizabeth yeah. oh I, I didn't want to interrupt it's always a little hard on uh, with this magical technology, I should say. I'm so grateful that we can actually talk across three countries. Um, I just wanted to, to add to that, uh, Kafka, that I'm, I'm always, you know, as writers, we're, I think we're all, and readers, all of us, and our listeners as well, uh, we're all always thinking about language. And I think language is one of the things that gets grabbed by greed. And the grabbing of the word growth which was a, a big word in, for example, the, the, um, in the US in the very early 20th century, especially after World War II. And the, this growth is something that belongs to nature, actually. And the grabbing of that word to express something that we feel some, or, or we're taught to feel is somehow progress or positive or, um, you know, but it, it in its very nature undermines the growth that we really grew out of, I think is, you know, I think it can be so um, revealing to, and we need more and more to unpack the language we've been taught about how to live. And I think that's part of what this, this pandemic is doing is it's inspiring a close look at, at language and the way we abuse language as well. And, um, one of the things that I found incredibly moving, it's, it's been traumatic for the world. And, um, and I know it's affected much more than the US because we've seen that in protests all over the world. The, is, is the, this phrase that's become a slogan that belonged to the private tragedy of one man killed by the police, I can't breathe. And he unwittingly gave the, I think, gave the entire world a motto that we would do well to pay attention to. Um, and it, it remains his, you know, I, I, 
I have some hesitation about seeing it commodified somehow. It's a private and family tragedy as well. But we are living in a world that can't breathe and increasingly can't breathe environmentally because of coronavirus, socially, and as we know, racially. And I think that as writers and readers, we, we really can um, grapple with some of this directly through language. So I love your word degrowth. I had never heard that before, but thank you for introducing that. Yeah, me too. I like that. And it, well, it reminds us, doesn't it, of defund part of the, the, the protests against the police, which, you know, you, when you first hear that, you think, oh, 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 how can you do that? How can you defund? But it means a lot. It means like put resources elsewhere. They don't need to all go towards um, this particular institution, which is not, not doing so much good. I just um, want the other word, sorry, yeah, go, go ahead, Kapka, yeah. Well, I was just going to, I interrupted you, Chris, but I just wanted to respond to, to Elizabeth, this idea of maybe we need new words, maybe we need to introduce existing words uh, to kind of reclaim, um, reclaim certain words, certain language that's been so cynically uh, misused, such as growth, which is nature's prerogative, not, exactly. you know, not the... Uh, the quarry's prerogative. Um, and maybe one of the words we need to introduce is, you know, ecosystem, but in a human, in a human context, you know, this talk here in Scotland and elsewhere of rewilding. Um, I think we'll see a lot more of that, more of the word and more of the actions, which is brilliant. And maybe we also need some kind of rewilding, rewilding of repeopling, repeopling, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Rehumaning, re rehumaning. I don't know. Um, I'm just uh, brainstorming here, but we need to reclaim some of some of this language um, and reframe it uh, with more kind of um, humane. Um, I don't know. A view in mind. Um, just as that old language is becoming bankrupt. Uh, you know, it's bankrupting our world and it is becoming bankrupt itself. And I think these mega companies um, who are usurping words like growth uh, are morally becoming more and more obviously morally bankrupt um, and becoming a thing of the past. This is, this is my hope. But Chris, you were going to go on to say something more about language. Well, just another word, really, the word heroes. Um, which has kind of been used as a way of uh, giving praise to health workers and almost treating them like soldiers on the front line. And I, I wasn't really very happy about that from the beginning. And I know now it's it, it, the health workers themselves like it either. But it's just another example of how a word can be used. It's not just a word. It's, it carries all sorts of meanings like they can be sacrificed you know it's a war therefore they can be sacrificed it's okay it's not okay if they die but they're heroes they'll live forever a bit like but the way that much, um yeah chris that's very much in keeping with the whole war language around the pandemic isn't it and yeah. elizabeth you know it's it been is, yeah. likened mm -hmm. to a war um and in britain in particular with this particular government which waves around words like patriotism patriot uh, winning, um, etc. Um, you know, this acquires a, a dark undertone. And I'm always suspicious when situations are likened to a war or when people are, are kind of called upon to, to fight against something. It's very unhelpful. I mean, this pandemic is not a war. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a biological mm -hmm. phenomenon probably caused by human, by human actions. Um, so it's very unhelpful. I think this language, like you, I was suspicious of the hero's um, label. Uh, it kind of ups the ante in exactly the wrong way. Um, it makes people more panicked, more kind of hysterical, uh, more suspicious um, and more fractious. And I think a toning down of language is probably 
required in these situations. But we can no longer rely on governments to set the tone on that one, can we? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Opposite. <laughs> Okay, so well, shall, shall I read mine then now? Yes, please. Lovely. And now is a good time. Um, okay, so let me just find it on the thingy. So some of those uh, issues that we've talked about already are going to come up in, in here. Um, so mine's called Greetings from the Global Village. By the time you read this, it will already be out of date. Our potato shoots will have grown another centimetre and the cherry blossoms will be fast becoming fruit. But I cannot say how many people will have died in New York, London or Madrid. There is more certainty in the village. I've been following Guo Jing, blogger from Wuhan, China, who was locked down inside her apartment for 43 days. The theme of these writings is alone together. And Gao Jing said that even in her isolation, she was more connected than ever to the rest of the world. It's a bit like that for me too. I may be living in a remote place, but I spend my days teaching English online to Chinese kids. In this remote Bulgarian village, I spent the month of February talking to them in their homes, sharing their intimate spaces and experiences of the quarantine to know their mums and dads and grandparents too, even the pets. As we know, the lockdown was much stricter in China than most other countries, and in Wuhan particularly, it seemed so odd to be observing what was happening, but little did I know at the time that the rest of the world was soon to follow. This is what I wrote on the 4th of February. Jeremy takes it on himself, declare the new tally of deaths, and then show me again the vast pile of dried food they have amassed in the hall of the apartment. His grandparents have moved in because they were barred from re-entering their own building. The cases of the virus were found there. A police officer is posted at the door to every block, testing the body heat of anyone who leaves. Those with a temperature are carted off to a hospital. For that reason, most people just stay indoors. You need a password to enter each apartment block. To make it difficult, this is more than just a single word. The password for theirs is an extract from Newton's Law of Physics. It's pinned up in the lift for residents to memorize. True story. The only vehicles on the streets of Shanghai are ambulances. In the lessons, Jeremy usually reads from Chinese science fiction novels, but he has now given up on the reading and spends the lessons telling me about the new situation. These days, for once, reality is more interesting than the books. Jeremy stayed indoors for 60 days. After 50, he had grown weary of sharing his anecdotes, and we went back to reading science fiction. Rosalind has an hour-long class every day. She says she knows how it feels to be a dog, kept in the house without exercise. Alice's father has even made a dog-sized litter tray for their Labrador as he can no longer take the beast out for a walk. Rosalind spends most of her time studying, but is missing her friend, but she calls her classmate on WeChat and props up the phone on the desk to make it feel like they are working together. Her mum is waving from the rowing machine behind as we talk. Nina lives in Wuhan and tells me emphatically that she cannot leave the apartment did not explain how this worked. Later I realised that she lived in one of the blocks where they had welded steel bars across the door of each one. On March the 13th, the Bulgarian government declared a state of emergency and everyone was encouraged to stay indoors. In the village, the drama hung in the air. You could touch it. Being in the countryside and walking in the landscape suddenly had a different quality even though nothing had changed. Silence was eerie, more than before, as if we were waiting for a storm to hit. Empty spaces of the village and the deserted houses seemed even more abandoned now. Anna offered us seed potatoes and brings them over, always keeping the two metres distance. In her face, she looks about 40 years old, but she is actually a great grandma of 75, though she is somebody who has to be careful. 
She does not let it affect her routine. Nothing can get in the way of the never ceasing preparation for winter, which drives village life from April to November. It would take more than a global crisis to do that. Exceptional times we do unusual things. My knife scrapes on the familiar pattern of a plate and then catches a snag, a crack in the blue English glaze that I had never seen before. And I wonder how I could ever have missed it. Everything is new. We go for a walk in the village and find a path we have never seen before. These times make us look at familiar places with new eyes. Once the virus had taken hold in Europe and the USA, it was my students who were now asking about me and worrying. Roslyn wrote a long message on QQ, which is a bit like Chinese Facebook, explaining how the authoritarian instincts of the Chinese state were exactly what was required to control a crisis like this. The Wuhan blogger struck a positive tone when she said, we are stronger now, but not better. We have not recovered. We will only be better when the rest of the world has overcome it too. For Gao Jing, the experience of lockdown had made her feel more connected to the rest of the world. The pandemic has the potential to connect the people of the globe like nothing else. Emmanuel Macron may call it a war, and the UK government too are happy to dredge up old nationalist tropes when they use words like frontline, common enemy and victory, recalling the Blitz and the Dunkirk spirit of the Second World War. In Bulgaria, the daily briefings are given by a military doctor who is always in uniform to remind us of, of his exceptional powers. However, our global experience does not have to be like a war. Once we look beyond our own borders, there is no human enemy. If anything, the virus unites us all. It is actually the opposite of war. When faced with a crisis like this, each government's response is to retreat inside its own national borders, and protect its own economy. By doing so, they only serve to emphasize what is different between countries. What the virus actually reminds us, though, is that we are sharing the same disaster, the same global experience. And that is a lesson we need to learn if we, to, if we are to have any chance of tackling worldwide problems like climate change. The great thing about this series of writings alone together is that they help us to keep the borders open, if only inside our own imaginations, and to spend these times of isolation reaching out across the world from our quarantine places. Thank you for that, Chris. Wonderful. Okay, it's such thanks. a beautiful piece and it does so much in a, in a short space. Uh, I admired that when I first read it. And can I just say to everyone that um, having recently read Chris's memoir, Waiting for the Goats, it, I, I just fell in love with it immediately and I can't wait for it to be in print. Um, so that you can all um, see what um, see what I don't want to go on about here, but it is a wonderful <laughs> memoir. It has that humane kind of that that way Chris has of connecting disparate lives and places and points in time, uh, the dead and the living, all coming together in this small Bulgarian village in the north of Bulgaria. It's, it's, it's really um, a beautiful literary work. I can't wait um, for it to be published. Thank you. Thank you. That's very sweet. I feel the same. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so maybe it's time now to go to questions from the audience, which we were hoping there would be some posted. Can't see any. Um, That's not exactly so. Uh, yeah, I just got one question via email oh, good. Uh, from Peter Fenton, who I believe is in the UK. Oh. So the question he, is... He might have something to do with me. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And by the way, the question has been recurring through the years and we actually built an entirely new pro program based on this question. So here to that. I know Kapka writes often about Bulgaria and yet lives in Scotland and Chris lives in Bulgaria but was brought up in the UK. I'm not sure where Elizabeth, where Elizabeth lives, so she lives in the US, but does the panel feel that living in a different country enables you to write better about the other country you know well or helps you to have a different perspective on what you are writing about? Chris, I think you should go first. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, well, <laughs> this is my brother Peter. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, well, you obviously it gives you uh, being in a, a country which is not your own um, gives you a, a fresh perspective, doesn't it? Um, you can see things, you can see the differences in things, the different cultural practices. And you could also bring your own, you could also look back at your own country and see that in a new light as well, which is a, a, a beautiful thing to do. How about you, Capco? Chris, you are interrupting. Oh, has Capco frozen? I'm here. I'm, I'm here too. Yeah, I, I completely agree with with what Chris uh, has, has said. I mean, it's about it's partially about perspective, and perspective is something that's that's ever shifting. Obviously, especially if you if you live in more than one place or um, intimate with more than one place. And I think perspective is something to do with. Um, precisely with intimacy, with, with, with how you connect with the place and its people and its history and its, its, various, its various layers. Um, it's also, I think, tied in, I mean, there's no one answer. It's tied in with the question of whose story are you writing? And that's something I really admired very much in Chris's memoir, um, Waiting for the Ghost, for the Goats. I almost said the ghosts slip. Um, which there are ghosts there. Um, how he how he tells many different stories, but in a very respectful way. He never usurps another's story, um, while at the same time not placing himself at the center of it, but managing to tell something of his own story and what led him to live in that uh, village in in the north of Bulgaria. Um, and I think our relationship with places is, is, is always changing as we learn more, as we grow, um, you know. I don't know if, if Elizabeth... Um, but, yes, I, I, thank you, Kapka. I, I have thought about this a lot, too, as a fiction writer. And, um, you know, in, in the big picture, we're suffering in the U.S. from a lack of exposure to other cultures and to translated work and, and just to the, we're suffering from our own isolationism. And so I think there's, you know, there's a very big frame around, around this. Um, but on the literary level, you know, I, I also can't wait uh, for your memoir, Chris, because that, that issue of whose story do you tell and how do you tell it and whose story can you understand uh, for, for me as a fiction writer it, that those matters are right at the heart of of imagining people's worlds and i've written a couple of times about bulgaria or about other countries but particularly bulgaria and i've always found that i had to make my way into those stories through the eyes of an American traveler. That, that, that was the way I kind of give myself permission to then try to imagine the stories of people who have grown up in a time and place I never experienced. In fact, very different from my own. So um, all those things operate in, in different ways, I think, in memoir, travel writing, and fiction and um, in, in poetry in a million different ways. But I think they come down to this, this same question you brought up, Kafka, whose, whose story is this? And the underlying issue of, of um, how to tell it based on what it is, what it says, and whose it is. Ultimately, I'm, you know, I'm thinking, for example, of Shadowland. Um, I think ultimately, you know, this whole debate of um, the debate surrounding American dirt, which I haven't read yet, but books like that, which 
where the writer does not belong to the same um, cultural group that is described in the book, whether it's fiction or non-fiction is perhaps less important. It's the principle that counts, but it strikes me that, you know, what you do, for example, in Shadowland is that you bring your, um, your wealth of not just knowledge, but also compassion and humanity to the way in which all the characters are described. Um, and I think ultimately that's, I think that's what counts and that's what makes a work of literature um, or a visual work or whatever um, entitled to, shall we say, or um, entitled to telling that particular story. It's the level of humanity at which the telling and the exploring takes place, um, I think. You know, uh, thank you. That's something I always struggle with, especially since I'm, I'm not um, interviewing people or describing what they say in, in, in a nonfiction way. I remember many years ago hearing a wonderful lecture by Toni Morrison, and um, she gave, it was at a college campus. And someone in the audience stood up, a, a student, who seemed likely to be a student or a graduate student, college student, and said, um, you know, uh, I, have a, I have a question. Do you, said to Toni Morrison, do you, do you think that um, people who are not from the background you grew up in and your, I can't remember how, how it was put, but your, your race, your group, um, do, do those people have the right to write about what you write about? And this was, it was, this was in the 80s. It was the beginning of a big debate about, about cultural appropriation in literature. And I'll never forget what Toni Morrison said. She, with her wonderful graciousness and humor and keenness and she said I know a lot of you in this audience are writers and she looked out over this audience of many 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 people between the ages of 18 and 23 and she said don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't imagine something and I thought especially given the you know, the, the history of cultural appro appropriation around things she had experienced herself. It was just a particularly wonderful and hard hitting and, and um, generous answer. And I've always remembered that when I've, I've struggled with the whole idea of how do you write about another country, another place, another culture. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you, Kapka, do you think you'll ever write about Scotland? Yeah. Maybe you already have. Yeah, yeah I am writing about Scotland now. Uh, but it's taken me 15 years, and I think yeah. it, it sh that's how it should be. Um, yeah. I, I, I have to agree. I have to agree. There is a um, big difference between yeah. kind of um, tracing through a place, um, which is often associated with the genre of travel writing which in, in itself is undergoing big changes. And between writing about place in a, in a, you know, in, in a broader way, um, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not leaving, you know, you, you will write about it and, and, and after that you will still be there. And so it's a different kind of relationship. Um, as, as, as when I write about the Balkans, I may not live in the Balkans anymore. Yeah. It's as if I'm always still forever there anyway it's a psycho you know it's a sort of psycho emotional imaginative level um so yeah i think the power of the imagination um yeah don't let anyone take that away from us um you know we just uh, got a wonderful question in the chat box and um I, I want to, if it's all right, I'd like to actually ask you, Kafka, if you would address this, because I think your work addresses it so powerfully, especially Border, in Border, um, your book that is about so many recent political issues, not only about 
deeper historical ones. So the question is, what do you think of the rise of nationalism, racism, and fanaticism on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean? How can literature help against them? And um, I'm passing this a little unfairly to you because I know it's also, um, you know, uh, involves uh, directed toward me as an American writer, which I appreciate. But I wonder what you would say about this. <laughs> <laughs> How can literature help yeah. against these things? I think literature is probably one of the few areas of life, collective life, that can do something constructive to, to counter, um, you know, these, these viruses. You know, I think we, we are, I, I think we can all agree now that, um, you know, a, a virus is something, is something psychic as well as something biological. And, um, Perhaps this particular biological virus is related to all the psychic viruses that have been sort of crawling, um, you know, among us for uh, for the last few years, such as the rise of all the isms, the destructive isms. Um, and I mean, I see that as as really the all the all the, all the rise of these isms is really the product of fear. If we have to reduce it to a kind of um, you know, a simple emotional, um, I think, um, sort of causality, I think it all stems from fear. We are collectively afraid of the future and clinging to really the dregs of the past. And I do see nationalism and fundamentalism of all kinds as really belonging to, to, to humanity's collective past. Um, the Bulgarian sociologist Ivan Krastev, I don't know if people are familiar with his work, uh, his latest is How the Light Failed. Um, and he talks in that book, he talks about um, this, this, this the phenomenon of fear and how people in their sort of panic of the future um, are really asking themselves not what kind of future do I want, but what kind of past do I choose? Which kind of past do I, do I sort of hang on to? Because, you know, a lot of us have trouble envisioning the future. So I think probably the key to this, um, I certainly feel that on a personal level in my life, but I think collectively as well, the key to this, um, you know, not surrendering to this fear um, is to keep envisioning, keep imagining um, a different way forward through language, I mean, since you know, some of us deal in language, but really language is just a tool. Um, I, I think a bigger question than language even is body. Um, how we embody right now in this very moment, things that we want to see tomorrow. Um, since you mentioned language, Kapka, there is another question uh, for you. Since you introduced the idea of reclaiming language like growth, can you think of some literature specific terms that writers can reclaim? This is from the chat. Mm. But before we address that, I just wonder if I can, um, I can uh, go back to Elizabeth on the question of what can we do as writers about this, the, the, the rising isms? Well, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I really I love what you said about this, and I was thinking that one of the one of the layers, one of the things that the um, byproducts of fear is and closely related to it is this desire to see things in very simple terms. That as human beings, we are very vulnerable politically to have having things simplified, so that we can see us and them and. Um, good and evil and um so that we can you know it makes us feel very comfortable on some level and it's i think it's a very dangerous tendency it tends to give rise to these isms and one of the things literature does in the act of reading the act of writing literature at its best and it's at its most uh at its strongest most um most imaginative is that it it leads us toward complexity. And so having having some, I think one of the things that 
that we can encourage in ourselves and our world in some humble way as as writers and readers is to lean toward complexity instead of it towards simplifying and of course that's very abstract you know he doesn't answer the question of how to do it but to me that that um rabid desire for for the simple is is something that literature is um literature is like an enzyme that goes in and helps keep that up <laughs> that's I don't know why I have these biological things in my mind in the moment, but yeah. But, the, but uh, to go back to Milena, Milena, you have this question um, from the chat, which looks very interesting. The question for uh, Kafka from chat. Mil yeah. Milena, you're muted. I think I found it. So do you want me to reread it, Kafka? Yeah, now I can see it. And I think it's a question to all of us. Well, it's, it's a thing for all of us really to kind of think on, but you know, Elizabeth already mentioned enzyme. I mentioned ecosystem. Um, you know, there's just something going on here um, where I will raise the awareness of what's going on with our earth is kind of seeping into our literary consciousness as well. Um, and I, I really embrace that. I recently discovered the word my, mycelia. I'm not even sure how to spell it. Mycelia, it's the underground uh, network of mushrooms. You know, a lot of well, trees and mushrooms have as much going on underground as overground. And um, it, it just strikes me that, you know, maybe we can do it some more sort of earth words in in our writing or in our consciousness. Um, monoculture is, is um, you know, at the root of, of all illness and imbalance, and it's man-made monoculture that um, creates um, viruses. And, you know, um, in border zones, you see what's happened to populations that have been, to use that hideous term, ethnically cleansed a previously rich um, ecosystem of cultures, languages, um, and faiths has been um, turned into a monoculture through either murder or forced displacement and migration. And a monoculture is inherently a very boring place that ultimately kind of um, um, declines into, into premature death. Um, so we can we can see that sort of thing going on at all levels, including the human societal level, um, which takes us back to Elizabeth's suggestion of complexity, multiculture. You know, complete. We need to rebuild complete ecosystems on every level. Interesting. Yeah. I'm sorry if that's not literary enough, but it's just what's coming to my mind at the moment. It actually is very much in line with some wonderful recent books, novels like The Overstory, and I think it's inevitable that literature and and to be embraced, as as Kafka says, that literature will grapple more and more with with the whole idea of the ecosystem and our place in it. And I love that you're expanding that term ecosystem, you know, to include the life so much and I've never thought before this so I've, I've never thought in this uh, way about monoculture as something that, that is it's not simply agricultural so thank you I jotted that down my notebook in his letters and that what was that word again mycelia mycelia I yeah, think and is that this is that the stuff that they're using to make uh, fake bacon with like oh. vegan bacon I think they're using something like that to make uh, the, 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 the only form of vegan bacon which actually tastes like bacon. <laughs> that's wild. <laughs> that's, that's the quotation of the day, I think. And um, as I understand it, they, they, trees actually talk to each other in a sense, in a biological sense, uh -huh. through them, even though they're unrelated species, you know, formally unrelated species. But now we know they're bacon as well. <laughs> it is extraordinary that uh, trees and and apparently mushrooms and many other organisms of which we are i think completely unaware most of the time do have this hidden communication 
um, system where mm -hmm. they support each other. Um, it, trees green community, growing communities apparently. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with um, a book written originally in German um, called The Hidden Life of Trees. Mm -hmm. We could learn a lot from trees, you know, how to survive, how to, how to nourish, um, and how to be secretive about the ways we sort of resist distraction and the impounder and the, 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 the lorries of the, of the quarry. Um, the secret life of trees. And trees also stay in place, don't they? I mean, we've all had some practice, unless we, uh, unless we have, you know, we should remember, I think, the, the many, many people who've gone out into COVID and had to do that or, or have been, you know, required by so many different forces to be out and about. But many of us have been staying in place and i've thought a lot during this this mm -hmm. time about how trees um do not they have communities as as Kafka, you just said but they don't they don't move around we've gotten used to being so incredibly mobile including all of us on this panel who like to you know who, who have tried to live in or do live in several different places and that mobility is um is is some i think it's been called into question to yeah. I love this. You, on that note, do you think your life will be different after after this? I mean, will you travel less? Will you do something more? I I would say yes, um, and I welcome that. Um, already before this virus came along, I was beginning to feel quite um, disenchanted with air travel and this kind of zooming mm. around um, in, a, in an unquestioned way. I was beginning to question that a lot and trying to kind of pull, pull out of some, you know, certain events um, for my own sake, but also because I felt that this mode of travel is just unsustainable for the, for the planet. And I'm thinking about the next generation as well and what we're leaving for them. Um, mm -hmm. and so yes, I think I will travel less and I will, and I will probably travel as little as possible, but make, make it count as much as possible. Um, if that makes sense. Um, and discover what's in your backyard. You know, I think that's been a big theme for people under lockdown. Discover what's in your backyard, which you have walked past yeah. for years without noticing. I think we've all had a bit of that. Chris, how, how has it been for you? The, the lockdown, well, for us, it, it hasn't been massively different. Mm. <laughs> we've, we've, because we've had a lot of freedom in the countryside, we can walk. And, the, you know, in Bulgaria, the cases have been so low that really the lockdown hasn't been that harsh. I mean, we're in, we're in Greece now. We're, in, we're on a Greek island. Things are opening up. So... We've been very lucky to be able to not have our lives affected so much. Um, can I just say, well, we must be getting towards the end now, can I just say that to everyone watching that the, um, if you've enjoyed this, um, for the foundation, the, the Elizabeth Cost of a Foundation re relies on uh, charitable donations and it would be great if everyone could give what they can afford i think the suggested donation is five dollars and i think milena has posted a, a link in the chat box to follow if uh, that would be fantastic but obviously only if you can afford it and um have, have we got one more question from the from the audience there are a few more questions would you like to choose any uh, yeah I'm, I'm not really watching it there are so many good ones in the chat box i, I wish yeah. you maybe had can another take one more. Uh, from your point of view which is the place of the writers now on the first line as a doctors of lack of humanity or is the supportive social workers working in silence and private and writing their books i believe 
Gosh, that's, uh, I think we, we all would have um, a lot to say about that particular one, but I'll, I'll take a crack at it if, if, that, if that's all right. Um, I think writing itself, if, it, if it's done for a didactic reason or a political reason or a social reason, unless it's social or didactic or political writing, begins to walk a fine line between literature and um, potential dogma. And I think that uh, as writers, our first, we first really need to listen to, in a, in a genuine way, to the voices that tell us to write. And if we do, I know, I know for myself, if I sit down and try to write an essay about something I believe that doesn't have a, a beginning in something I have observed or imagined or cared about in a personal and literary way, it's absolutely certain that it will fall on its face. I'm, I, and I, I know many writers have that, that kind of um, uh, experience. So I always, maybe this is the bias of a fiction writer, but I fall back on the idea of stories. I think stories themselves are incredibly powerful. You know, um, everyone in this panel has collected stories from living people and people who are no longer with us, voices of history from interviews and from research, whatever genre we write in. And those stories by themselves, there's something powerful and um, important, I think, about actually uh, making, saving them, preserving them, using them. And then um, I think we also have our own stories to tell. And it's, it's the, the universal themes that come out of those stories, not because we plan them, but because they're already there that that are really important in all of this. And so I, I can't, I would never pretend to be a doctor for humanity or for any cause exactly. Um, but I do think that we're all advocates for stories. That was a little bit halting. But um, I, I think uh, my two fellow panelists are such great storytellers and story collectors that um, perhaps you'd have something to say about this also. No, I love this idea, Elizabeth, in what you said that you, above all, as an artist, you have to remain true to, true to your material or what, what you believe your material to be at a given time. Again, it's a very dynamic process. Um, your perspective changes and your material changes in, you know, um, as you develop as a writer and a human being. But this idea of remaining true to the inner voice, I think is essential, especially in such distracting times of sort of almost never ending crisis. You know, if it, when the virus is over, we will no doubt have another crisis. So I think for a writer, this, this um, ability and this self permission, I think, to always listen to the inner voice is essential, an essential tool um, for survival. Um, it ensures that we continue having something to offer. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, to, to, to answer the question, um, I think we uh, writers are much more like social workers. Than, as Elizabeth said, than doctors, because there, there's no, I'm not sure writers can give a cure, but they can certainly support and care for people, people's imaginations. So that would be my answer. Um, yeah. Well, look, this has been a great experience. <laughs> I think there are two more questions that um, I can answer, actually, uh, oh, yeah, because yeah. they're asking about the series. Um, yeah. What's next with the series and what uh, do they exactly entail? Um, so all texts that have been published so far are available on the website. The series um, 
had nine issues and each issue features Bulgarian and American or English language writing. Uh, so we can see this nice mix of uh, languages as well. They are available on the website and we are compiling now a small online book that will be on the website. And uh, in the forthcoming series, we will actually have a more asynchronous events uh, like that, but not synchronous. And there will be video exchanges by authors paired together. And some of the forthcomings include uh, Vladislav Todorov and Georgi Guskudinov, Philip Graham and Melissa Wan, uh, Vilisa, uh, Vil Vilina Minkov and Christos Hartumatsidis. So they are, uh, all these pairs are former uh, Sozopo Fiction Seminars fellows uh, and faculty who are involved in uh, video exchange. So with that being said, I think, uh, thank you so much, everyone, Kapka, Elizabeth, and Chris, and thank you to the audience. And I'm sorry we cannot take more questions. And I'm sorry, I actually would like to apologize to our Australian friends who wrote me several messages that the timing is not good for them at all, because in, in the middle of the night, oh. Of course. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> thank you to our growing network that spans over all continents, I believe, by now. And Milena, you, uh, this is recorded, yeah. is it? Uh, yeah. Yes, the recording will be shortly available also on our YouTube channel and uh, social media. So you'll be able to revisit if you want or share with your friends. Okay, and thanks to you, Milena, too, for you so much. making it all possible. Yeah. And for the invitation, it's been great. You are a wizard, Milena. Yeah. I prefer the birds uh, from my window to Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's perfect for this talk. <laughs> yeah. And thank you, Chris, for your excellent interviewing and stories and beautiful readings. Oh, yeah, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, it's really been lovely. It's been nice, it's been nice to see you all. And you too. And to have so much great audience with us. Great yeah. questions. Yeah, thanks to everyone who came along. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Karen. Bye. Safe and well. Bye. Bye-bye.